three that you can. Oh, perfect. So welcome everyone. Uh, we're gonna head off into our third session today, radically improving staff, sat staff satisfaction using Montessori. Before we get started, um, a few kind of housekeeping items that, uh, that we need to go through. And that is mostly that you can earn up to three NAB, NCAP, NCTRC, and or NCCDP CU credits uh, for today. So to earn your credits, you need to attend the, the four session. So one session in four or as many as three, four session. And then to get the CUs, you need to fill out this information in the survey that you're gonna get at the end of the day today or by email. Um, and you need to do this before Friday, December 9th, which is the end of this week. And uh, so that we can process your certificate of attendance and issue up again up to three hours of certificates for you, CUs for you. Please note that due to the very large number of attendees, uh, certificates will be sent by email um, throughout next week. So starting on Monday 12th, but no later than the end of next week, which is the 16th by the end of the day. Each certificate is gonna be emailed individually. So you get one email per certificate. And if you have any questions about these certificates, please contact us after December 16th um, if we're missing something or if something's wrong. As a reminder, the uh, session is being recorded. And also, as I've mentioned several times, and most of you in the audience have done an amazing job, you know, please participate, please contribute in the chat. Just make sure that you select everyone so that everyone can see your contribution. And then if you have specific questions for our um, amazing uh, panelists, please have them in the Q&A so that it's easier for us to manage. So with that, again, Gary, the third time today, excited to uh, reintroduce you again, Gary Johnson, Leadership Development Consultant with Monarch Pathway. I'll let you both take it away with Alex. Excited to have you. Thank you very much. Charles, thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Um, and I'd like to just take a moment to uh, introduce Alex. Um, so Alex is a, a person who works in Sarasota, Florida. Uh, she is in charge of the uh, Director of Healthcare Services at a uh, a really gem of a place, uh, CCRC. Um, and I've gotten to know Alex over the last number of years. And I can just tell you, I, I truly admire her, her leadership and the way that she's approached Montessori by not trying to control it, but by giving it energy and oxygen. So she's going to talk about that a bit. And so we've had some questions before uh, in the other two sessions about, well, how do you get other departments involved? And is this really all about the activities person? So Alex is real boots on the ground and can and can talk about a, a number of those things. Um, and uh, Alex, do you wanna say anything else about, uh, about yourself? No, I think you covered it. Thanks for having me. I'm um, Alex from Sunnyside in Sarasota, as Gary mentioned. Good, thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, I, I wanna start off before I share my screen and number one, say thank you for sticking around for the third session. <laughs> um, so that's great. Uh, but I wanna, I wanna call my, on I wanna make three comments to start off and kind of frame this. And somebody mentioned before, well, what about the regulators related to persons with dementia and Montessori. And what I'd like you to think about, what's the equivalent for staff? And I would say the equivalent for staff, what we typically hear is what about the managers? <laughs> so the staff are concerned about their bosses and everybody is concerned about regulators. And so those are people who control. Those are people who uh, I would say oppress or press folks. And there are really interesting ways to implement Montessori, which, which Alex could talk about as well, related to residents in, in a regula regulated environment. But we're really gonna talk about staff. Um, we also often hear when we, when we are get involved with a, a, 
a neighborhood, an organization, or company with persons with dementia, oh, this won't work with our with our residents. You don't know our residents. The, 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 this may work with other residents, but not with the ones that we have. And I'm going to say the same equivalent often happens to us when we talk about Montessori related to staff. They'll say, well, this won't work with our staff. You don't know our staff. Like, this, this won't work. Um, it won't work with this company, right, for various reasons. Um, and, you know, what's really fascinating is also when you say, can you imagine a person with dementia leading a group and that the staff are doing a good job when they're not seen? I want you to think about, can you imagine frontline staff leading things and not being led? Can you imagine that, right? So it's the same thing. So Dr. Montessori worked with children, and I like to think she just happened to work with children. She could have worked with persons with dementia, I would suspect, and she could have worked with employees. She could have worked with unions. She, we, we work with a number of places that are either unionized or not unionized. Um, Montessori um, really worked with people and tried to find their humanity and tried to find how to see them as human beings, how to have them be the best versions of themselves. And so that's what we're going to talk about right now. And how does that apply specifically to staff? Um, obviously, Alex has worked in long-term care. She's a nursing home administrator. I am also a nursing home administrator. I started as a nursing assistant. But Cameron and I work with a number of companies that have nothing to do with healthcare. Um, so this is really about being human. And this is about how do we treat each other and how do we love each other? And we're going to specifically apply that to how do we love each other um, at work. So I am going to share my screen. And... I'm going to do that. And Alex, can you see that okay? Yes. Okay. So we're gonna talk about discovering principles that radically improve staff engagement. And those principles we're gonna talk about are Montessori principles, but the reason that they work is because they, promote communication, they reduce fear, and they promote individuals growing. So remember, Dr. Montessori was a rehabilitation doctor. So she focused not on what persons couldn't do, but what they could do. So imagine focusing on that related to an employee, what an employee can do as opposed to what they can't do. Um, so here's a just a quick story to start to start us off, um, I was walking in an organization and I walked past a room where there was a resident, there was also oxygen in the room, and there was a housekeeper in the room with a cigarette in her mouth. And so I, I wasn't, you know, a staff member there, I was there as a consultant, but I knew enough to walk in the room. <laughs> And when I walked in the room and I, I said, hey, uh, my name's Gary. I'm pretty sure you're not allowed to smoke here. And she said, well, I'm not smoking. I have a cigarette in my mouth, but it's not lit. And I said, well, I'm pretty sure you're not allowed to do that. And her response back to me was, well, show me where that is in the human resource manual. Show me where it says I can't put an unlit cigarette in my mouth and, I, and then I won't do it. But you can't show it to me because it's not there. So I went and talked with the management group and I said like, oh, hey, I think, you know, you might want to pay attention to this person down there. Um, there's, she's got something going on. And their first thought was like, wow, um, she's an adult. She should behave like an adult. And why do we have to deal with this kind of behavior? Now, I want to pause this for a minute. If this was a resident, one of the things that Cameron and Stacy just talked about is we would think about responsive behavior. Why is this person behaving the way they're behaving? And we would have started with saying, what do we know about this resident? Who are they? 
And so when talking with the staff about, well, who is this person, um, come to find out they didn't know a lot about her. Um, and when you think about, well, why would a person behave the way they're behaving? Why would they have that cigarette in their mouth? Long story short, you know, this person, once we figured out, well, who is she? We realized that, boy, she had had a lot of blows in life. And she ended up getting a job as a housekeeper, which was quite a sort of pay structure down from what she had been used to. And she had a lot of losses in her life. And I think the long and short of it is the only thing she could control at that moment for her with an out-of-control life was putting a cigarette in her mouth. That was a method of her controlling. So her behavior was based on an unmet need. Just the same thing that we would do with a resident. And then so if we start thinking like if we thought of her as Montessori would have taught a child who was having a behavior issue in school, what would Montessori have done? She would have said, let's find the strength. Let's follow the child. Let's learn what the child is really all about and see if we can find a path for them. Well, lo and behold, that person many years later is still working there. Um, did a number of different shifts through the pandemic. She wasn't just summarily fired. And so that's really about applying Montessori principles to staff and seeing them as people and also understanding what our role is when a, when a person behaves in a certain way. So it's about learning how to communicate with no fear and also finding ways that each one of us can learn and grow. I'm gonna just put this up on the screen just for a second, just take a glance at it. These are the principles that Stacy and Dr. Camp just talked about, but these are the principles translated into what it would mean if you apply them to a staff person. So when you think about it, how many folks when they are told to come to a meeting feel like they're invited or are they feel like something's being done to them that their work has a sense of purpose and captures interest they're offered choice when they're learning the instructor demonstrates more and talks less um, they present the my organization presents learning that matches my personal pace they use hints cues or templates to help me do my work when we tackle a problem here, we go from the simple to the more complex. So I won't spend much more time on this, but the skill, I think, and one of the things that Alex is just very good at is trying to use as many of these principles at once, not all of them, but as many as you can to activate when you're interacting with an employee. And they're not linear, so you don't need to start from the left and go to the right. But when you're interacting with a person, what Dr. Montessori did is said, hey, if you can activate these principles, they are going to feel less anxious. They're going to feel more confident. And they're going to be what humans are naturally. Humans are naturally curious and they like to learn. And that's where you get into the middle of respect, equality, and dignity. So that's that's really what, what Dr. Montessori was all about, was when someone was having difficulty, she wasn't, I don't think, as concerned with the origins of uh, bad behavior. She was more concerned with where did that person want to go and what are roles that that person can play. So Alex is going to talk about that pretty extensively, about roles that people can play at work that uh, I think managers are doing. And so it comes down to that um, mantra, really, that Dr. Montessori had that what you do for me, you take away from me. And in fact, I think she might say it even stronger, you're robbing me of that, of that condition or that situation, you're robbing me of an experience. I won't spend much time on this, but Stacy at Winsong, they're using these principles as their staff engagement survey. So I, I just find this fascinating. So we've turned this into a 12 question survey. So it's not a big long survey and asking staff, hey, how are we doing as an organization applying these principles to you? Are you offered choice whenever possible? 
um, does your company find a way to help you focus on the things that you do best? This is a very different engagement survey. I'm going to talk here in a minute about the level of engagement in the country, but it's terrible um, and it hasn't changed much. So we need to do something that's very different. So we're rolling this out um, with uh, Stacy's company and also with a pretty large company in the middle of the country with, a, you know, I think 10 or 15 locations. And uh, using this as the sort of pre and post related to staff engagement um, and measuring sort of other things that you might think of as retention, workers comp, things like that. Now, what you see on the screen is, is a, a cloud or a series of clouds. But what I want to ask you to do is look at this picture and imagine what you see. Do you see anything in this picture or do you just see clouds? This is a large group that we have on the on the webinar today. So I'll, I'll tell you that when I show this picture, oftentimes people up in the top right will say, oh, I see a rabbit. Down in the bottom across the screen, they'll say, I see a train. You can kind of see the smokestack of the train and the cars going across the bottom, going from left, uh, right to left. Um, I want to say that as adults, we sort of lose or we get numb to the idea of imagining. It's hard for us to imagine where it's easy for us as children. Children sort of naturally imagine things. When we're in long-term care, it's a pretty messed up situation and we need to imagine something new. And so applying Montessori principles to staff is new, but it takes imagination because it can be hard to see. And so we have to start practicing using our imaginations to see something that's, I would say, radically different. Um, and we're, I don't know that we've ever been at a time more when we've needed something, something radically different. So I'm going to show you three images here. So here's an image of a group of folks with their hands on a log. So they're working together. Here's a picture of a person that is breathing in fresh air and feels inspired. Here's a per picture of a person with a graduation cap sort of signifying learning, that she's learned something. So I'm going to ask Alex here to kind of chime in. And so Alex, is it possible in like a morning report or when you're meeting with your team that they could feel like they see each other as people. They're not there just for as a tool to accomplish a task. They're not an object, but they're a human being, that they're actually learning together and that they can leave feeling inspired instead of de-energized. Sure, so um, a couple of things. So when Gary and I started working together years ago, one of the first things he shared with the group that um, was in the room was, um, what would it look like to us if we were intentionally building community? So as we're working with each other, um, how do we envision community? And so often we think of it as resident um, is our main focus, but really it's employee to employee and peer to peer. And we can very inadvertently disable um, the people we come in contact with by not providing each other a role and value in the conversation. So um, I, I intentionally try to work to create an environment that's um, open for everyone, uh, has limits, but giving freedom. And so we've done this by a couple ways. And certainly there's been interruptions along the way, the pandemic and regulatory, which has been mentioned numerous times today. Um, and we are continuing along this journey and will continue to focus, bring this focus back to this here at Sunnyside. But one of the really neat things that came out of this a couple of years back is we implemented huddles and this huddles rotated leadership. So it wasn't led by me. It wasn't led by the director of nursing. It was signed up by whoever wanted to lead it that day. Um, and they started the session with a very quick warm up. It was a 15 minute meeting, all disciplines attended. We stood up in the hall. We did a prayer, a short warm up. And then we got the day's um, necessary items out there for everyone to hear about. 
But what was really neat is people signed up for it. So it wasn't me or someone else running around asking people um, or telling them to do it, but we really were encouraging and inviting people to sign up on their own. So they felt like they had a purpose in the meeting instead of it being just directed and here's what you're doing today. And then it created an environment that they felt they had more freedom to provide input. Um, so that would be probably the, the first thing that we worked hard at implementing here years back. Um, and then as things changed and got interrupted with the pandemic and, and such, we've had to use that in different ways to continue um, to make sure we're creating that environment that people still feel valued in. Yeah, one of the really neat things, Alex, was um, Sunnyside was interested in having a best practice of huddles. And let, let's talk about that just for a minute with, with everybody on the webinar. What I'd like to ask is, if you have a huddle in the morning to kind of get through your day, what percent of time in that huddle do you talk about resident care? And usually people will say 99 or 100% of the time it's about resident care, thinking like, oh, that's what we're supposed to be doing. But it's rarely about each other. It's rarely about how do we see each other as people? What are some of the structures that we can put in place that we intentionally build what Alex just called building community? So one of the neat things that happened, uh, just like you saw in the videos from France, when you have people do instead of just be, instead of you know just having someone lecture to them, but they're doing um, I showed a video to the, the team there at Sunnyside about, uh, I think it was from Dartmouth uh, Hospital about huddles. And what they said is, oh, why don't we, why don't we make our own video? Um, and by the way, we're not going to call it you know, their morning thing. They're not, we're not going to call it a huddle. We're going to call it a no and go. So they made it their own. They shaped it and they decided to script and form a bit, make a video and then share that with the new staff that came in. So just like with Montessori with persons with dementia, you don't know where people will take it. But that's part of what happens when they're not oppressed. When they can find their own voice, they do neat things. Um, and when you have that structure and that framework in place, they, I think, find a way to surprise you. And they also find a way that you you can be in awe. You, you should step back and expect, expect miracles, expect surprises, just like what Cameron said. I'm going to go back just real quickly to this uh, slide. So Alex employed these, these um, principles when she implemented the, the morning huddle. So one of the key things that she did is uh, there are good visual hints, cues, or templates to help me do my work. They had a clipboard that had sort of the template of the meeting. Well, that leveled the playing field so that a housekeeper, a maintenance person, felt more comfortable. They had something in their hands. They had something to hold in order to lead the meeting. And at one point, um, they had signed up two months ahead of time. The, the meeting was... Uh, had that many people that were willing to lead it that they sort of had uh, a lead time of two months. So I think the idea that uh, you can offer that and prepare an environment where staff can step into and have roles to play is such a critical thing for radically improving staff engagement. Just by definition, that is the definition of engagement. People are doing things above and beyond their job. They are at work and they're passionate. Yeah, Gary, another thing I could add there is so often we get into the routine of doing morning meeting and clinical reports, and I'm guilty of it myself, forgetting to take a moment just to let the staff kind of interact and talk about their days and their nights before the meeting starts. Um, and then to start with some sort of inspiring thought or a prayer or a reminder of the mission or what, whatever is valuable to you know, your group, the stakeholders at your community and um, keeping this at the forefront because it takes an extra two, three minutes, but it's really impactful for the people that are given that opportunity instead of just expected to sit and, and listen the whole time. Yeah, and it takes courage as a leader 
to, to really work at preparing an environment and then watching things happen. So I was at a place in Cleveland and I was talking with a director of nursing. It was a large place. And she said, oh, I would never let um, an activities person or a nursing assistant come to come to my morning huddle with, with their own warm-up question because I wouldn't trust what they're going to do. And I, I was like really taken back by that. I was like, wow, imagine what it feels like to be an employee there that you wouldn't be trusted to come to a meeting and be responsible enough to 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 bring a quick warm up. Um, and it's interesting. I was at another place in Cleveland uh, recently where they're they're really active at doing this, and they had the coolest warm up. They had a, a it, it was a, their morning group, and they said, "How much money would you t would you need in order to stay in a haunted house overnight?" <laughs> and so uh it was very interesting what people said some people said like oh, i wouldn't need any money i'd love to do it and other people would say you, you can't pay me enough and what i'm saying is when that happens they see each other as people and all of a sudden they're not an object they're a human being and that is what starts the whole framework and the structure and the foundation for engagement and what dr montessori did was she said the kids need to see each other as kids they need to see each other for who they really are. And what Dr. Camp has really just applied this to is persons with dementia are really, are really um, incapacitated by us having low expectation of them. And then they live up to that expectation. Well, we know children do the same thing in school and we know staff do the same thing. So how do you get out of that? Um, in the United States, the average engagement for employees is 30%. So 70% of people in a company are walking around with one hand tied behind their back. It's actually shocking and very discouraging. Um, if you look at applying Montessori principles, there's a place in Los Angeles, California, where they have doubled the, the national average on engagement, and they attribute it solely to applying Montessori principles to staff. They are also applying them to residents, but they equally apply these same principles to staff. And so they're up, and you can see their amount of people that are actively disengaged are, have reduced down to 40%, so to 4%. So those are the people at work who are still working there, but they're actively working against you. The 36% are people that are at work and they're they're sort of going through the motions. They're there and they're not there. The 60% are passionate about where they work. And so you say like, well, what does this really look like? So if I were to see a place, um, what does that look like? So I'm going to describe a couple different things and then I'm going to let Alex describe what it looks like at Sunnyside. What, what would we see if we walked in there? So one thing that we would typically see is getting rid of annual evaluations. We know that annual evaluations are a disengager, and we know that they really um, serve little to no purpose. So not only do they disengage folks, and they're actually harmful, but you know even on the surface, they have really little value. Um, and so the, it really goes to a thing that can see an individual, a staff member for who they are, and someone can actually sit down with them more than once a year and just say, hey, can we look at each other? Can we see each other? And can we help each other grow? So one thing that we would see, and when we look at Montessori schools, in a public school, you're sort of limited to stay in your grade. But in Montessori schools, you go between grades. So it looks very different. So Montessori for staff engagement looks very different. It means that um, someone can actually sit down and know your preferences. So Alex is going to talk about this when people get hired at Sunnyside. How do they understand what their preferences are? How do you have a care plan for each staff similar to you have a care plan for a resident, right? Why do you have a care plan for a resident? Because you're trying to adjust your organization to meet their preferences. But a resident's just a human being, and so are staff. 
right? So why wouldn't you want to do that for both? Why why would you only want to segment and do that for one for one aspect of your organization when really you're a community? Um, in fact, many some places have gone to to call uh, residents and staff community members as opposed to segmenting them with different names. Um, it's interesting in Australia they call nurse and assistants care partners, not not caregivers, because it's a partnership. The nursing assistant and the resident that they're caring for can learn from each other. You heard uh, Jerome talk about dreams and Stacy as well about like a dream committee for residents. Uh, there's a place that we work with that every employee in their job description has a line that says that they're um, they are able to dream on the job once a week. And the reason that they do that is because they realize that innovation comes often from dreaming. It comes from when you clear your mind and they want their employees to be innovative. They need innovation. So they're saying like, yeah, as a person, it's important to dream. So they actually memorialize that in, in everybody's job description and say, we trust you to dream. We trust you to daydream on the job. And they have that kind of with the structure, like Alex said, where there's some um, structure about that. So it's not a free for all. Montessori isn't a free for all. But it also allows people to be themselves. Where do you get your best ideas? How do you come up with things kind of out of the blue that sort of are breakthroughs for you? It's often not when you're thinking hard about something. It's when you don't think about it. Um, uh, I'm going to go through two more things. They also, when a person's new in their organization, uh, they surprise them at the end of their first day with the dining folks making a meal for their whole family for them to take home. And they're doing that in part because the dining folks feel very confident about the food that they make. They're proud of it. But they're also doing that because they realize they don't want an employee to feel like, hey, it's just the employee with the relationship with the organization. It's also the employee's family. You know, it's very true. It takes sacrifice to do these jobs. It's also sacrifice for families as well. So they want to recognize and say like, yeah, we we want to thank the family also for, so for entering into this relationship with us. Um, and then the last thing, which I thought is very instructive, is the CEO realized when he started thinking about um, uh, Montessori with equality, dignity, and respect, and he realized that he has a business card and some of the executives had business cards, maybe a few of the managers, but certainly the frontline staff did not. And he started to say, like, well, how is that about equality? Why do I have a business card and why do they not have a business card? And as they thought through that, where their Montessori journey led them is they all now have a business card. Right. Everybody has a role to play. They just have different roles to play, but they are equally important. So he wanted to demonstrate that physically by um, saying like, yeah, hey, we all should have business cards. So if if you want a business card as a frontline staff, um, you get that on hire. So it does many good things for them. Um, so Alex, I want to pause here and um, I think I want to jump to some of the sunny side things and I'll come back to the um, uh, uh, appreciative inquiry if we have time to do that. So I'm going to jump to town halls, champions group, and roles. And I'll let you start wherever you want there. Sure. So um, I, I want to start by saying it's definitely a trial and error process. So there's been times we've tried to roll out 15 different um, initiatives at once and found that um, we need to relook at it, start small, become successful in, in smaller things um, and build on that. But there is some consistent practices in place that really continue to drive, um, I would say, an a, a environment with freedom for the employees. And um, we have a core champions group that um, is, is no one that was 
picked by me or Gary, um, anyone who would like to attend was invited to attend and continues to be invited to attend. And I do not participate with um, intentionally in that group to allow the staff to feel like they have the freedom to collaborate and um, innovate ideas and also to face challenges and work through those without feeling like they're looking to a supervisor or someone for the answer or to direct them. Mm -hmm. And they've been so successful um, with this. They've come out with numerous ideas and one of the awesome ideas that we have in place and, and is still building on its momentum is called the Better Together program. And what this is, is all new hires and all existing staff uh, complete a Better Together checklist that um, questions their interests and engages them with uh, other like staff that might have similar interests but also our residents complete it on our whole campus. So the independent living assisted and skilled nursing facility residents and our memory residents as they um, are welcome to our community to pair people up with similar preferences. Some examples of that would be maybe a resident in the nursing home that loves to be in a wood, woodworking shop and they've been paired with an independent living resident to go and make a birdhouse in our wood shop and then it came back and was hung outside a resident's room who loved to bird watch. So all of their interests are aligned with each other to give people opportunities to really focus on their strengths and not what they can't do and to allow us the opportunity to pair them with not only other employees but residents. So that has been really successful um, and continues to build and that was completely out of the champions group. And Gary put on the screen match.com because he was in a conversation where they wanted, the champions group wanted to borrow the match.com's um, algorithm and system to put in place here to match residents and employees together with shared interests. So really an awesome concept um, that we're happy to have going. We also want employees to help build the care plan. And this is a project we're working on currently. On hire, we do an all about me and my favorite thing checklist. And it really asks them things from their hobbies to their favorite foods to their goals. And then we are creating a profile on every employee in the facility um, that's accessible to the supervisors as well, the, as well as others. If they notice them doing something or just want to recognize them or simply just to get to know more about them and help um, drive their goals with them. Um, we have those documents shared on everyone. So both the Better Together checklist and that All About Me have been um, helpful in creating a care plan for each employee and making sure that we're putting the value of the employees just as important as the value of our residents. Um, in town in hall, so everyone has a different name or, or style that uh, our town hall is a monthly get together with our staff and some interesting things um, that we do in the town hall is we've had one of our um, people that are on the champions team teach a Montessori principle to employees each month and they actually go as far as um, inviting the employees and reminding the employees that we want and we encourage you to sit down to do a puzzle, to read a book, to engage in a conversation. And we all want people to do those type of things, but sometimes in, in place to feel empowered to do that, but sometimes just hearing it again from someone in a leadership role in an open town hall setting has, has made it feel much more comfortable for some of the employees as they go about their day to day. So giving the employees the freedom and the knowledge um, and the resources to know we, we do want you to on the clock, stop what you're doing and just engage in a conversation and enjoy a puzzle or some time with a resident. Also in town hall, we have recently started our, um, we've always started our town hall in a prayer, but we are asking our residents to begin us with a prayer. So that's really kind of setting the stage at each of our employee town hall meetings that we're all here for the same thing, the, the mission we're reminded of, and we're also 
able to interact with the resident in an employee group who, who leads in that prayer and integrating the residents back into that type of program has been, I think, rewarding for both the resident that has been able to do it. And I think as we continue to grow it, we'll see a lot with that. You know, Alex, two, two things that come to mind is mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I loved uh, when, when they started thinking about the better together and, you know, independent living residents started thinking, well, are there things I could do to assist in assisted living? which is called the manor there. And then what I thought was fascinating is that the residents in the, so the manor would have folks uh, that would have some, probably some level of dementia. Um, some may not, but um, they start thinking like, well, hey, maybe it can go the other way and we could help people in independent living. Maybe there's things that we could do. So that's about equality, right? Where they're sort of saying, how do we do both? And someone had asked earlier in, I think, in one of the questions and answers is about how do you involve all departments? Well, one way to do that is to start small where you can be successful and start things that involve the whole group, involve multiple departments. Um, I wanted to ask you to talk, Alex, a little bit about the difference between horizontal and vertical, particularly with employees. Sure. So um, you can read articles dating back probably to the 80s. I think Harvard Business um, has some articles back then about leadership styles becoming much more horizontal is a desired leadership style versus the vertical leadership style. And with the Montessori initiatives, we've really been able to see that kind of come into play and the uh, importance of those conversations as, as we have workforce issues and newer res or younger residents. Um, so one of the things where Gary touched on was the Gallup survey and whether it's Gallup or Holleran or any of those satisfaction surveys, we I'm sure all have a question that asks about communication. And communication so often is perceived as top-down communication. And when it's measured, do you feel like you're being communicated with? Um, and at times we get very frustrated with the scores because we feel how much more could we say? How many more meetings can we hold? But when you step back and look at the uh, trend to have a horizontal, which means a, more of a peer-to-peer -peer leadership style instead of a direct um, down vertical style. Um, the communication that needs to really be measured is interdepartmental communication, peer-to-peer -peer communication. So we changed our question on our engagement and satisfaction employee survey a couple of years back and our results showed, and through some other one-on-one -on -one conversations, our results showed that it wasn't top-down vertical communication that employees were missing or had a desire to have uh, increased satisfaction for. It was peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer communication. So is dietary given the opportunity to have a conversation with activities, the CNAs, the nurses? So the communication from department to department was being scored as being the most valued, much more important than top-down vertical communication. And I shared with Gary the other day that um, for me, it was a huge relief to have that identified because as a leader, you always are, are kicking yourself saying, how much more can I communicate? And so it, it almost gave me the freedom to focus and feel more engaged with programs um, like the Montessori initiatives and other leadership um, programs, because that's what the, the employees wanted. And it opened up a whole new understanding of, of the impact of that question is about communication and your scores. Yeah, so um, it's it's pretty fascinating, you know, when, when uh, I'm going to tie some things back to what uh, Cameron said, uh, and, and based on what Alex just said, you know, Cameron had mentioned um, cognitive ramps and having um, residents when they 
when they aren't apathetic and they are interacting together, one of the things that is helpful to prepare that environment for is how about empathy and conflict resolution in a person with dementia? And he and his wife wrote a book about that. And, and I would say it, the same is true with staff. When they take on roles to play, when they um, start um, finding ways to engage their own passion, they have to have some way or measure of having a handle on each other. And one of the things that I thought that Sunnyside did that was very neat that, that we wanted to introduce to you is a, a thing called personality lingo. Get curious instead of furious. This is not, this is a thing that you can get on the internet. It's a really neat thing. Lots of companies use this. You can think of it. And again, I get kind of obsessed with this, but if you think about equality related to staff, it's often the executive group or maybe the next level of directors that get personality sort of inventories, Myers-Briggs, DISC, things like that. But it really filters down to everybody in the organization, right? So it's sort of, um, it's an elitist thing, really. And some of that's based on cost. Some of that's based on thinking, well, we need this for our jobs up here, but you don't. But when it comes to horizontal communication, when there's a diet change, and so dietary has to interact with nursing staff, those are two human beings interacting. And those are two groups of human beings interacting. And so Sunnyside went through an exercise with, with everybody about, let me see if I can bring this up. It's a really neat little, very quick five minute thing that lets you know what your communication preference is. So this is a, a ramp. This is a way to store things externally um, for staff. So when you do this quick little series of questions where you rank things, you come out either as a mover, connector, thinker, or planner. You know, the short version of that is when you get in an elevator, a mover is a person that pushes the button and wants to go quickly. They're not looking for other people to join them in the elevator. <laughs> a connector is one that's holding the door and seeing as anybody else want to come. A thinker is one that gets in the elevator and moves to the back in case other people are coming in. And a planner is one who's looking at how many people can this elevator take? <laughs> What's the capacity and how many people are in here and do I need to get off? Well, we have all these people at work. We have all these people in our teams. We have movers, we have connectors, we have thinkers, we have planners. And um, I think one of the neat things that Sunnyside did is they did this for all the employees is they sort of said, well, who, how do we know what our communication preference is? And then if I know what your preference is, can I adjust myself to you as opposed to having you adjust yourself to me? And I think Alex are doing that with uh, new employees that come in. Yeah, so that's one of the things that, you know, to be fully transparent that we're teaching in our orientation, but we have opportunity to get back on track. It kind of got derailed with some of the um, things sure. over the last course of time with the pandemic, but we still include it in our orientation to get people thinking about um, that they may just be talking to someone that is a mover and not a connector, but that doesn't mean they can't have a relationship with them or um, that they don't have like mindsets. They're just going about the same thing a little bit differently. So um, it is a great tool that we had 100% of staff complete and, and we've got to get back on track with that as of late. Yeah, you know, the neat thing is right now people are ready to re-engage. Yeah. I mean, I think the world is sort of ready for, I'm tired of sort of being stuck. We want to move forward. Yeah. Um, I had an interesting experience at Sunnyside with a group of nurses where I was in a conference room and it were, there was a number of nurses coming in to this um, meeting. And when I walked in, there was, I think, four nurses already in the conference room ahead of time. And... Um, so they said, oh, can you guess 
what our personality lingo is. And I said, oh, you're probably planners. <laughs> and they said, yeah, we're planners. We're here on time. We were walking with some other nurses who are connectors and they stopped to talk to people. And in the past, we would have gotten angry and thought of them as disrespectful. Like, if we can get here on time, why can't you get here on time? But we realized after we did this exercise that it wasn't personal. They weren't doing that personally to us and being disrespectful. They were connecting. That's their preference. And so um, just as Cameron says, as folks come alive, they need tools in order to help them sort of navigate that new world. So employees, I think in general, have been used to being oppressed, kept in a small box, and really the life sucked out of them. And so as you apply Montessori principles, it's almost like giving someone an IV and they start inflating. They start feeling like back to their self again. And then that's a new world. We have to kind of reimagine what that looks like at work when people are um, being the best versions of themselves. I interviewed two dishwashers in um, uh, Michigan. And this was a place I was having trouble keeping dining staff. And so I had, um, I ended up, yeah, I live in Maryland, but I ended up talking with these two folks like the second day they were on the job. And I asked them, I said, hey, what would make this job really a great experience for you? And the one said to me, when I was younger, I came to this nursing home with my family after church and we sang songs. And I would love to have a little bit of time sometimes to just hang around with a resident here. I, I would, that would be great. And the other person said, well, he came there with the Catholic priest and was the altar boy, and he would um, assist the priests as they were doing the church service. Um, and he said, I would also like to spend time um, maybe once every couple of weeks and do something, uh, an activity or something with the residents. When I talked to the dining director and I said, would that be possible? He said, no. He said, they've got their job to do. We're behind as it is. Um, uh, that's not in their job description. I mean, that is what we're, that's the primary thing that's prevalent really in our work environments. And so he couldn't see them as people. And so of course, as you can guess what happened in two weeks, they quit. And I think he thought, well, I'm doing a good job. Like I'm keeping them on task. That's my job to keep them on task. But he couldn't see them as people. He couldn't see them and he didn't really understand what motivated them, what would have been important to them. Um, he saw them, I believe, as an object in order to accomplish something as opposed to a person, just like we want to see residents with dementia as people. Yeah. Um, so the other thing um, I wanted to just mention, if you think about... Um, care plans for staff talk can you talk about that a little bit alex when we think about care plans for residents and we think about well how do we think about seeing staff as individuals sure i think um as i had touched on earlier that all about me and the better together checklist gives us uh, a, a understanding of who the staff member is and how we can better engage them in the facility. And there is um, someone in the chat asked, what about people that don't want to be a part of this? And I think we all face that. And not only um, does it make some, some challenges as you go through the journey, but utilizing that care plan and what they do love and what their interests are and connecting them with other people that might share that could help them along their journey. And, and there's always going to be people with reluctance, but just continuing to find connections and engaging where they do have voice interest is my suggestion or advice for that. Um, I am a planner by um, just have always been a planner. So this whole journey has really challenged me 
in my personal interests because I want to plan and at times control and know what's next. And so I've really been able to learn a lot and embrace just the organic changes that come along with this. Um, as I see staff that may not have been engaged previously joining in and collaborating because, oh, something that maybe didn't pique their interest has now. And they're they're not even realizing that they are a part of it. They are, they're joining in because we found something that has tapped into their beliefs or their interests. And what I just want to comment to say is my biggest accomplishment to hear from a resident or from someone else is, well, um, the residents are doing her job or um, the residents are leading that program because that's what we want to see. Or, or a resident saying, well, so-and-so was sitting in the middle of their shift doing a puzzle with someone. That's really where you know the, the good stuff starts to happen is when people are engaged enough that they're noticing that the residents are extra engaged and people continue to buy into it, I think at that point, and, and it just blossoms from there. Yeah, and you know, Alex, it's an interesting phenomenon that I would say when you apply these principles with residents, they're kind of institutionalized and it takes them a while. Number one, the first thing residents typically say is, am, am I allowed to do this? Mm -hmm. And I never thought you would ask. That is very true for staff as well. They don't trust that this is something that's going to come and be there and stay. It's going to last. Um, they also, I would suggest, often think somehow I'm going to get in trouble. Mm -hmm. Somehow I'm going to get fired over this. You're asking me to participate. Somehow I'm going to mess up. So you're saying that, oh, it would be great if every two weeks you help someone with a bird feeder, as an example. Maybe a resident that's interested um, or you're joining an exercise class for men and you're, you're a bodybuilder, you know, you're a, and it takes a while for people to realize like, well, somehow if I stay an extra five minutes, is someone going to fire me? Are they going to write me up? Um, we're, we have institutionalized staff and they are afraid, I would say, number one. Um, and number two is we have to work to prepare the environment. And what Dr. Montessori said is start slow where you can be successful. And so you just have to begin. And as you begin, you'll find a path for yourself that works for your culture and in and, and, and the particular, your skill set as well. So I think you've done an amazing job, Alex, with finding your way through being a planner, but letting something organic happen. Yeah. And that's also true for residents as well, right? And and I would just say, to, uh, whoever asked that question, wouldn't Dr. Montessori have faced that same thing with a kid who says, I don't want to participate? I'm not learning math. I don't like this school. Like, get me out of here. And a resident that waits at the door and says, like, as soon as it's unlocked, I'm walking out. And it's because they have an unmet need. And so our job is to say, well, what is that need that's unmet? Um, and, you know, the classic thing would be a person that's feeling lost and empty in their job, but some musician, and that we would love to have play their instrument with residents, but nobody, nobody's asked them. And somehow if they do get asked, then someone else gets jealous. Well, why do they get to do that? And I don't. And so that's what we have to start to figure out how to overcome to let people have roles that they can play. Um, and you got to start on that journey and start small and then build in structures that help support that. So what you see on the screen, and I know we're right at the top of the hour, when you see that thing on the screen, that's a structure that's helped Sunnyside support their initiative for multiple departments to work together and have staff have a way to have a handle on each other and to start to just start to begin to be vulnerable with each other and see each other as people. Okay. Very 
similar to what Dr. Montessori did with kids, very similar to what Dr. Camp is trying to do with persons with dementia, is to not underestimate them, but to prepare, prepared to be amazed. And I would say, Alex, have you been amazed? Absolutely. Yeah, it's heartwarming, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, Charles, I think we're right at the top, I think, of the hour. Hello. Hi again, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, we're, we shift into the uh, happy hour, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to take the time. Alex, thank you so much for uh, your amazing contribution. Gary, obviously, as well. Uh, as a reminder to everyone, especially the ones that are jumping off right now, the survey is uh, a way for us to uh, to get CEUs. So I know that Megan is, uh, as always, amazing and dropping it in the chat, uh, but you will also get it by email. And so again, yes, this wraps our third session today, a very successful uh, international conference for Montessori. And why don't we head now into our happy hour?